So we're going to end the night um, with Evan Handler. And a lot of you may know Evan, uh, recognize him from his roles on Sex and the City and Californication. Very entertaining shows. Anybody? Anybody watch? Yeah? <laughs> Sex and the City, Californication. Great shows, right? I love them. But I'll admit that I, that's not actually why I'm a fan of Evan. I'm actually a fan of Evan because I'm an enviro geek. I love talking about environment and health and that kind of stuff. And Evan Handler that makes, the Evan Handler that makes me a fan is the one who writes powerful, moving, and yes, even funny books about cancer. The one who helps give voice and power to cancer survivors. And for those of us that have to deal with this, the gift of laughter amid this situation is a gift, is a deep gift. And the one who travels to Washington with CH and Tony to fight, to push Congress members to fight for us and to protect us from toxic chemicals. That's the Evan I'm a big fan of. And it is my pleasure to introduce him, activist, author, and inspirational pessimist, Evan Handler. She looked at my Twitter page. Um, I've never had that used in an introduction before, but I like it. Um, okay, uh, have you had about all the talk you can take for one night? Can you stand a little bit more? Um, before I do my prepared remarks, because I have prepared remarks, um, I want to say that Michael Green does the most incredible work of anyone I know. but he makes me feel so dirty. <laughs> like I just want to burn everything I own or, or, or like vape it or I don't just eliminate it somehow and be naked and don't touch anyone or anything for the rest of my life, which I guess I'll start tomorrow after I sleep in a hotel and take an airplane. <sighs> and and uh, maybe have a couple more drinks. Okay, thank you everyone for having me here tonight. Um, I was here a year ago, over there, because they changed the configuration of the room. I don't know if that happens administration to administration or what, but I was over there. Um, I have to say, asking someone to speak at the same event in the same room in front of many of the same people two years in a row, you know, it makes the presumption that I've got a whole new set of poignant experiences <laughs> You know, with, <laughs> with which to perfectly illustrate the importance of the work CEH does, and I don't. <laughs> uh, since I saw most of you one year ago, uh, I have driven my daughter to school every day, over and over again, and that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> um, that could be seen as a good thing. Depends on how you look at it. Uh, but I had the realization that repetition is actually part of CEH's bag of tricks. It's not in a bad way either. When something works, they use it again. And one good example, among others, but I'm a Californian, so it's the one I know, is California's Prop 65 and other individual state regulations like it. For those who don't know, many of you do, bear with me, Prop 65, enacted in 1986, was a voter initiative that passed by a two-to-one margin. We don't have elections like that anymore, right? Um, it requires businesses to notify Californians about significant amounts of chemicals in the products that they purchase in their homes or workplaces or that are released into the environment. Makes you wonder about the people who voted against it, but, you know. <laughs> no judgment, no judgment. Um, most significantly, though, Prop 65 allows individuals or organizations like CEH to potentially sue businesses that do knowingly expose Californians to toxic chemicals, which seems a reasonable exchange to me. Now, no one likes excessive or frivolous lawsuits, I guess, except lawyers, maybe. Um, but no one likes lead in children's toys or cadmium in jewelry either. No one likes carcinogenic caramel coloring in their soda pop, which were all there. So everyone asks nicely for voluntary remedies at first, but sometimes you run into those that are best described as bad actors. And we're not talking about the thespian variety. Um, when that's the case, the ability to sue or to threaten to sue or to threaten public exposure and embarrassment have proven to be extremely useful tools for CEH in protecting all Americans from exposure to toxic chemicals. 
Now, the way it usually goes, and I mostly know this from reading newspapers, is that the very mention of something like a Prop 65, corporations will throw their own repetitive conniptions in which they complain that there's no way they can possibly reformulate their products to the widely divergent standards of every state. You know, can't do it. There needs to be one national standard, they will say. And then they proceed to reformulate their product to the strictest of all the state standards and sell that single formulation throughout the nation, which is definitely a good thing. So you see, in this way, it is actually laws like Prop 65 that have helped to set the national standard for removal of toxic chemicals from products throughout the United States. This tactic has worked again and again. So why am I telling you all this? Well, I told a charming story here in this room last year about how my brother and sister and I used to love to run and play in the clouds of insecticide that spewed out of the spigot of a small roadside tractor every Tuesday night in our neighborhood. The fog man, we called him. Or her, I don't know, it, whatever. We didn't grow up in an agricultural area. It was somewhere between rural and suburban. It was just done because people didn't like mosquitoes. Better living through chemicals was the slogan of the day. Now this or something else, or the nuclear power plant four miles down the road, or nothing at all, resulted in my being diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia when I was 24 years old and being told that it was incurable. After I told the story of the fog man last year, at least five or six people came up to me after the speech to say very excitedly, we used to do the same thing, which only made the story more chilling to me. And I think that's when CEH realized they had a good tie-in for their message that night. Like, wow, he's been really fucked over and he can sell a joke. <laughs> this could work for us. And there's a show business saying that goes comedy equals tragedy plus time. <laughs> Successful advocacy apparently equals undeniably harmed plus humor. So in keeping with their strategy of repetition, CEH asked me to travel to our nation's capital and to accompany Ansha Miller, Tony Stefani, Carly Katz, and Jill Allen Murray into a series of eight meetings with high-ranking congressional members and staffs during which e we each said exactly the same thing over and over again over an eight-hour period. It was awesome. <laughs> they wanted me to tell my Fogman story to congressional leaders in an attempt to preserve the powers of Prop 65, which were being threatened. Mr. and Uncle Goes to Washington was how my cousin Rob sold it to me. <laughs> sure, why not? Um, I wasn't really sure exactly what role I was supposed to play on this team, you know? I'm not an expert on policy of any kind. I had zero experience in meeting congressional members to lobby for or against anything. The fact is, though, that the meetings ran super smoothly from the first second, and each one took almost exactly the same form as the others. Ansha and either Carly or Jill from the Sheridan Group would introduce themselves, give the briefest description of CEH and its mission, and then turn things over to either Tony or me. Tony, if he took the plunge first, would, as you've now seen, give the most riveting and harrowing account of what firefighters are facing in terms of the chemical soups they submerge themselves in every time they enter a burning building. The statistics, which I don't think he mentioned in regard to cancers among firefighters, are just chilling, unacceptable, and in case it needs to be said, unsustainable. And then I would tell my story about chasing the fog man through the clouds of insecticide. <laughs> <laughs> I'd point out how in 1970 we didn't know any better, but that now we do. And I would ask, how can we allow the same things that happened when we were ignorant to happen when we're not. But since we were there to lobby for highly specific language modifications to a bill currently being negotiated, I went a little further and I gave my sort of layman's interpretation of the issues. Like I said, I have no expertise in policy, but I'm, 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 I'm pretty good with common sense. So I talked a little bit about California Prop 65, how organizations like CEH use it, and how Prop 65 and other state laws like it were really the yardsticks by which to measure how protected Americans are against toxic exposures, because national standards are not what have been protecting us. And remarkably, everyone in Washington right now is in agreement that the Toxic Substances Control Act, or TSCA, of 1976 is woefully inadequate and outdated. So good opera, bad law. That is, that's, that's why they're at work trying to formulate a new one right now. I actually don't know if it's a good opera, I just know the name. I've never heard it. I think it's Verdi, because I looked it up on Google, but I, I don't know the opera. Um, 
All right, let's make believe I take that out. I'll just skip over it. Still, the news of Prop 65's influence was surprising to many of the lawmakers with whom we met. At least one stated openly that prior to meeting with us, he had no idea what Prop 65 was. I went on to say that while it's great news that everyone, Democrats and Republicans, are in favor of raising national standards, if the bill under debate is allowed to usurp any state standards that are more strict, that it will actually, in practice, lower the standards for everyone. You know, national standards come up from here to there, right? But if the new law eclipses or preempts standards like Prop 65, and that's how it was originally written, then the effective protect protections actually decrease from here down to there. That's the little trick some members of Congress, along with the chemical industry lobbyists, have been playing, announce dramatically stricter national standards that go, uh, and that actually in practice lower protections from everyone from here. And boo. <clears throat> and this is where my lobbying talents were revealed, my value to the team. Because it turns out I'm very good with the illustrative hand gestures. <laughs> so I pulled them out in every meeting. They're just like, they're going, eh, eh, eh. Over and over again. Eh, eh, eh. Office after office after office. Repetition, threaten, sue, repeat, like CEH. And they seem to get it. I mean, some of them more than others, you know, makes perfect sense, some said. But more often than not, what we got were varying mixes of defeatism, cynicism, and exhaustion. My favorite was a representative from Pennsylvania. He listened to my impassioned plea about keeping today's little children safe from the kind of poisonings that I was subjected to. Then he turned to the others in the room and he asked, is he new around here or what? Then back to me, he said, you think anybody on the other side of this issue gives a shit about anything you just said? <laughs> he went on for a while that way, explaining to us that the people who put that language you don't like in there, they're pretty smart too. That language you don't like is the only reason industry came to the table. They're not gonna change that language. And then he fed us the refrain we heard most often that day. We're trying to get a bill passed here. Okay, that's not something that happens very often around here anymore. So I'll raise your concerns, but I wouldn't hope for very much. You know, people in Texas are gonna ask, and this is them asking, not me, they're gonna ask, why should California get to tell Texas what to do? So I gave him the old hand gesture. <laughs> not this one, this one. I showed him that California wasn't telling Texas what to do at all. Texans could continue to poison themselves to their heart's content. All Prop 65 was doing was telling companies what they could and couldn't do in California, after which those companies then chose to make and sell their products just as safely in Texas and Wisconsin and West Virginia. And he looked at me kind of sideways, and he said, I guess I can see how you might view it that way. Now, to give you an idea of the minutia being fought over day after day on Capitol Hill, these are the changes we were seeking two weeks ago. The text of the new bill stated, essentially, that nothing in this bill shall preempt or otherwise prevent a state from enforcing any action they have made prior to this, which is good language for keeping Prop 65 and laws like it. Except it then says, unless an action or determination by the administrator expressly conflicts with such a state law, which is bad because it takes away what was just given. It says that the new law cannot preempt previous state laws unless any current or future EPA decides that it can. So we were going from office to office trying to get the unless language removed. Should it prove impossible to get the entire unless clause removed, we were asking that the word expressly be changed to actually. Because somewhere there is a lawyer who believes that that change will make all the difference to citizens and CEH down the line. <laughs> I pray that they're right. Uh, that's what the people in Washington are doing all day long. They're battling over changing expressly to actually. They're grinding away at it. Now, each and every representative we saw told us that what we wanted was almost certainly not come to pass, but that they would look into it. They weren't enthusiastic about broaching it, but they would try. But within 72 hours of our visit, by a vote of 21 to 0, including members of both parties, 
what we were told was all but impossible was accomplished. That's 21 to zero. <laughs> including Republicans who were opposed and Democrats who were unenthusiastic about trying. Like how my incurable leukemia really wasn't, expressly was changed to actually, and we walked away feeling like we had in some minuscule way defended a meager slice of the future. 21 to nothing. <laughs> but, <laughs> that was only one committee hearing, focusing on one clause. The other lesson, in addition to the one about how every effort is essential and nothing is impossible, is that the struggle never ends. For this moment in the process, these state laws have been preserved, but that doesn't guarantee that the lobbyists will not eviscerate them in the final law. We need to remain vigilant in our efforts to see this through, and then there will be the thing after this, and then the thing after that. But what we did two weeks ago, involving two, three, and four syllable words, was wildly successful. If preserved, it was an accomplishment that will keep California's Prop 65 and similar laws in other states safe, and therefore keep Texans safe from themselves. <laughs> and Iowans and Ohioans and Arizonans, because together, tougher, because new, tougher Tosca standards, should they even pass, are still gonna fall far below the protections Prop 65 offers Californians and therefore offers everyone else in the nation. So now a few more congressional leaders than before realize the way things have been working and how much state laws and organizations like CEH have been protecting their constituents. It's work that absolutely has got to continue because, and this is the most stunning and troubling takeaway, the federal government ain't doing it. The EPA is not doing it. There was no dispute about that in our meetings. It's a given. The people of the United States and the federal government have been depending on state laws to keep the people safe. It's as simple as that. So don't be fooled when you see headlines appearing touting new, tougher national standards. It's a trick. Eh? Eh? <laughs> Unless and until they insist upon and deliver national protections that match the toughest state standards in the country, the work CEH does is of absolute importance. It is essential. I came here last year in support of it. I went to Washington to support of it. I'm here tonight in support of it. Threaten, sue, repeat. <laughs> Repetition is getting the job done and there's no end in sight to the need. So I hope later tonight you will all lend your support and repeat as well. Um, thank you very much. I'm now gonna turn the stage over to our Tackling Toxics Together ambassador, Mr. Michael Tate. Thank you.